Sup, beeholes. <laughs> um, I have a lovely video for you right now. Um, earlier this morning, I was able to chat with Alec Navala Lee, author of Astounding, about this book. And I did it for the podcast, the Pulp Fic Lit Pod, um, but I thought I would put it on here as well, just so more people can hear about this book and hopefully go get it. So, um, I will be adding fun little things into the video to make watching a video of an audio podcast more enjoyable for you. So without any further ado, here it is. How did this project come about for you? So um, I've been writing short science fiction for a long time uh, for Analog. Uh, Analog was the first magazine I ever sent a story to, and I published about a dozen stories or so there uh, over the last 15 years. And um, at some point, it occurred to me uh, to write a nonfiction book about the magazine. And, and kind of in the earliest stages, it was going to be a, a book where I would just kind of go through and read uh, 30 years of analog and astounding and, and write up kind of my take on how the genre evolved, um, which, you know, would have been wow. a really good book for someone to write. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what happened is that I, I discovered really early on, probably the first couple of days uh, of thinking about this project, that there had never been a biography of John W. Campbell. Um, and I, I still can't believe it. Um, you know, he's such a great subject for a book like this. Yeah. He's so influential, so controversial. Uh, he had a really uh, fascinating personal life. The primary sources are just unbelievable. So, again, I was just kind of flabbergasted that nobody else had written that book. And I was like, okay, this is available. Uh, I want to do it. So it kind of evolved from there. When you're doing a project like this, how long does it usually take to do something like that? Uh, well, I don't know how long it would take other people uh, to write this book. And it's obviously the kind of subject where you could spend 10 years on it. Uh, you could spend a lifetime. You know, um, the, the closest equivalent in some ways is uh, there's a two-volume biography of Heinlein that came out a few years ago by William Patterson. And he would probably spent a decade or more on that project. Uh, in my case, it, it ended up being about three years, um, which I think is about the, the, the minimum it, it would have taken because it took a year just to kind of get a handle on the, the sources. You know, yeah. I had to read a bunch of stories. I had to go through a bunch of letters. I had to kind of read all the stuff that was out there. And then like another year or so to kind of write up what I found and then kind of the like at the end of the usual revision, you know, stuff leading up to publication. Um, but, yeah, I would say it was a full time project for about three years. Was there a lot of traveling involved for you in that? Um, not, not directly. Uh, I mean, I, I did have a chance to go to conventions. Um, I was able to go uh, to Worldcon and to the Nebulas and kind of track down people like Robert Silverberg uh, and James Gunn and, you know, the, the handful of people who are still around who knew Campbell firsthand. So that was crucial. Um, I was lucky that a lot of the research uh, I had to do was available online or um, in a form that I could access remotely. So I had to, you know, get copies of uh, letters made for microfilm. I had to, you know, get copies of Campbell's papers made. Uh, so, for example, probably the coolest thing I found in the whole project was I found the original uncut draft of Who Goes There, uh, which is the story by Campbell yeah. that was later adapted into The Thing. And, um, you know, this was just kind of lying in a, in a box at Harvard University. And, and no one had, had even looked in that box for probably 40, 50 years. And um, I couldn't get out there personally, but I, I hired an, an assistant to make the copies for me and kind of send me the scanned files. And I, I went through them and I found this amazing manuscript, which is actually being published on Kickstarter right now. So, oh, nice. uh, yeah, so if people are interested, uh, you know, it's called Frozen Hell. And it's already blown past all of its, uh, you know, projected, um, you know, the, um, the goals on, on Kickstarter. So I, I don't benefit personally from that project, but I think it's super cool. And if you like the thing or like, like who goes there, you should totally check it out. Yeah, that um, without getting too much into it, when I was reading the book and I came across the bit where 
you basically say, and this is probably where the inspiration came from for that, mm-hmm. I screamed. Like, I, <laughs> it was, I, uh, I gasped out loud. My wife jumped and she screamed. She's like, what? And I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, that was so amazing. Like, um, that was just terrifying. And that's a horrible way to talk about it because I don't want to ruin that surprise for anybody. But, um, Getting away from that for a minute, um, in doing a um, biography about Campbell, um, what made you want to kind of tackle um, Asimov, Heinlein, and Hubbard in with it? So these these three writers would have been a crucial part of the story, no matter what. Yeah. If you're going to tell Campbell's story, you can't avoid uh, Asimov and Heinlein, and especially Hubbard. You know, people kind of look at the book sometimes and kind of wonder what Hubbard's doing there in the title, um, mm-hmm. as if you know he does, doesn't deserve to be named among you know these other oh, science fiction huge. writers. Yeah. Um, but you know, you can't tell the story of Campbell, or by extension of Astounding, or of the Golden Age or science fiction without mm-hmm. dealing with Hubbard at length. Yeah. Um, so you know that would have happened. Either way, um, what actually made the difference and made them more prominent in the, in the, in the story that I was telling was actually a note from my editor. Um, so I went out with a proposal uh, for a book that was basically about Campbell. It, it was just sort of like a very straight Campbell biography. And um, the editor who ended up taking the project uh, said to me, you know, this sounds great, but Campbell just isn't, just isn't familiar enough to mainstream readers to kind of justify the book. Or you know to kind of be able to sell the book to um, kind of like a like a more general readership. Yeah. And she asked me, "Are there other writers we can bring in?" And I said, "Yeah, we got Asimov, Heinlein, and Hubbard." Uh, and she said, "Great," because obviously you know they are among the most famous science fiction writers uh, of all time. They belong in the story organically, and so the, the the book kind of expanded to become this group biography, which um, I think was a great call. I think I think it made the book more interesting. Yeah. I think it you know. It, expanded its potential audience enormously. And, um, you know, I think it, it's a story about the circle of writers, you know, and one of the things that fascinates me the most is uh, their interactions and kind of the way they worked together and competed together for years. Do you think that, how do you think the magazine would have changed if World War II didn't happen? That's broad as heck, but. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question because um, I think about this a lot. Uh, if you look at, um, you know, where all these writers kind of left off, uh, you know, before Pearl Harbor, you know, they were really on the cusp of becoming something very interesting. Um, you know, Heinlein had uh, just sold Beyond This Horizon to Campbell, which is a really interesting, innovative story. Uh, Asimov had really kind of hit a stride with uh, Foundation and the early robot stories and, and Nightfall. And even Hubbard, you know, the, the, the stories he was writing in this period, like Final Blackout, are actually really good. Um, and I feel like they would have just kept developing. I think Campbell would have been very happy to kind of guide them forward, uh, you know, for the next few years. But the war just kind of interrupts everyone. You know, it kind of freezes them in place. Heinlein stops writing. Hubbard stops writing. Asimov writes only kind of occasionally. Um, and it means that when they all kind of reconvene at the end of the war, uh, you know, it's like the band is, breaks up, right? It's no, Campbell is no longer able to really influence these writers directly anymore. And they'll kind of go off on their separate ways. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, obviously Heinlein and Asimov especially went on to do great work. But, um, yeah, no, I think it really kind of disrupted this, uh, this almost like a, like a brain trust that Campbell had created. And, um, you know, clearly it didn't, stop them from having a massive influence on science fiction. But yeah, there, there's a whole other version of the story that might have happened if it had another couple of years just to develop some of those ideas. And do you think that um, Campbell not having control of that situation um, led to the decline of the Golden Age at all? Um, I wouldn't say that. I think um, the, the decline of the Golden Age in some ways is a result of Campbell attempting to assert control uh, over it, uh, you know, after the war. And yeah. I think, uh, you know, that, that, that's one of the themes of this book, that, you know, these writers had to break away from Campbell eventually because he just was limiting what they could do. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, I think... Campbell had taken um, Heinlein, certainly, about as far as he could go. Uh, I think Heinlein was ready to, to move on at that point. Hubbard, you know, I can't really say. I am very curious about what he might have done with Asimov. Um, 
you know, if they'd been working together more closely, because there is a big break uh, where, they, where Asimov wasn't writing uh, while he was working at the, the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. And again, this is the same period that, that produced uh, Nightfall and the Robot Stories and Foundation. And, um, you know, I mean, I, obviously Asimov did fine, uh, so, did, so did the genre as a whole. But, um, you know, that, that's the one kind of counterfactual where I kind of wonder what stories would have come out of that partnership if um, it hadn't been for the war. Um, like Asimov kind of, um, gives Campbell a lot of credit for, um, psychohistory and the three laws of robotics and, um, Campbell gives it right back to him. Um, was there any evidence you found that leaned more one way than the other? I think it's pretty clear that Campbell influenced Asimov profoundly. And uh, if anything, I think he's being a little bit generous uh, later on when, when Campbell says that, you know, he kind of found the three laws of robotics, for example, in Asimov's stories. Because if you go back and read those original stories, you, you, you kind of see the first law of robotics, um, you know, it, but it's not really stated explicitly. And, you know, it, it really was Campbell who said, you know, these are the three rules that we're going to kind of build the series around. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that psychohistory was not part of Asimov's original pitch for foundation. I think that just, you know, clearly reflects yeah. Campbell's interests. Uh, so, you know, I, I think on balance, um, I, I would credit Campbell for, for a lot of that stuff, uh, you know, and that's partially because Asimov was so young. I mean, he's, he's 19, 20, 21 during this period. You know, he's, he's, he's a very young guy. Yeah. He is in awe of Campbell. And I think he really wrote what Campbell wanted. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think Campbell, uh, absolutely deserves credit for um, many of those ideas. What effect, well, not effect, but how did other editors um, at other pulps in town, let's say, um, think of Campbell? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it, it kind of, it, this is a little bit outside my area of expertise because I was so focused on astounding uh, yeah. for this, this book. Um, and I don't, actually don't know the history of pulps like, um, like amazing stories or, or wonder stories as well. Um, but I do think that Campbell was seen as kind of an outlier, uh, even by other editors. Um, for one thing, he was the only editor at that period who actually had a background in science. You know, he, he got to MIT and Duke and he, he definitely had like the, the background to, to, you know, kind of feed these ideas to writers. Whereas other editors were mostly, you know, they were, uh, editors who'd worked in other pulp genres, you know, they, they come up, um, you know, either out of, um, other magazines or out of science fiction fandom, you know, and they weren't necessarily people with the kind of scientific background that Campbell wanted. Um, so I think, yeah, early on, there was a sense that Campbell's interests were distinct from those of the other magazines. And I think that um, he was also appealing to an older crowd. I think uh, it's pretty clear that um, even though Astounding didn't even have the highest circulation uh, for you know much of this period, it, it definitely went after mature readers, professional readers, you know, people that, you know, were out of their teens, um, mm. Whereas like wonder stories and, and amazing, you know, we're, we're going for a younger, a younger audience. Uh, so I think that also really affected the way Campbell was perceived. Now, um, were you surprised at all by how big of a part, um, the quote unquote women behind the men played in their lives? I don't think I was surprised by it. It was certainly something I was conscious of, um, you know, just kind of reading what other people have, have written about uh, these writers. Um, the, the big example for me uh, is uh, the Jimmy, or the uh, William Patterson um, uh, biography of Heinlein, because he, I mean, that book is is very useful. You know, it's, it's a major work of scholarship, and I, I had to lean on that, you know, a lot for, for um, a lot of the material that kind of fell outside the, the main focus of this book. But he is really hard on Leslin, and you can even when reading it. And I also include other Heinlein scholars here. You know, reading the stuff that has been written about Leslin's life and their marriage. You know, you can see that it's slanted in Heinlein's favor. Um, and a big part of that is because you know they divorced, and Heinlein married Virginia uh, uh, Heinlein, and she was kind of in charge of the estate. She definitely oversaw Patterson's work. So you know, it kind of reflects you know who was around to tell that story later on. Um, so one of my goals going in was to kind of bring out Leslin's story and to kind of give her the benefit of the doubt and, and you know, try to correct that, uh, you know, interpretation of, of that marriage. Um, 
And, you know, for someone like Donya Campbell, you know, she barely appears in any previous history of science fiction. But it's, mm-hmm. it's evident, you know, really early on when you read Campbell's letters and her letters from that period that she was um, – his partner, you know, not just in, you know, their marriage, but in his professional life, you know, they worked together on stories and she helped him out, you know, at at the magazine. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's really obvious. And, and so, yeah, there's obviously, um, you know, it it was one of my, it was one of my goals, uh, you know, from the beginning to kind of bring out those stories too. Nice. Um, and as far as, uh, fandom, goes this is like a big thing for me here um the futurians played a really big part in kind of what everyone knows about today what kind of part did they play in um campbell's life let's say well, this to me is actually really interesting because um, the Futurians included people like Fred Pohl and Donald Wolheim and Asimov, you know, and people that went on, or Sherlock like Kornbluth, you know, who went on to play a huge role in science yeah. fiction. Um, but Campbell didn't really like them, and you know, he 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 was not close to that that group of writers. Um, you know, he, I mean, obviously Asimov was his protege, but, you know, he did not get along with Pohl. He did not get along with Kornbluth, uh, or, you know, definitely not Wolheim, you know, uh, and I think he kind of regarded them with suspicion or wariness because they were a bunch of weirdos who were obsessive fans who, um, you know, he knew he, he couldn't control them. Uh, and, you know, there's this really interesting dynamic. If you look at the accounts of fandom, in New York, at least, during this period. There's kind of like the mainstream, kind of like more tractable uh, fandom that someone like Sam Moskowitz uh, and and New Fandom represent, where they're, you know, running conventions, they want to get to know writers and editors, they want to play nice, you know, and so they, you know, Campbell seems fine with that strain of fandom. But then the Futurians, you know, they are they are politically active. You know, their politics couldn't be more different from Campbell's. You know, they're very yeah. vocal in, you know, complaining about stories they don't like and kind of trying to, you know, uh, nudge, you know, the, the, the genre in certain directions. And, you know, I, I think for him, for Campbell, that was, you know, he, he was very uh, – he, he wanted to keep them at arm's length. Yeah, and so you get this like interesting sense where you know uh, the Sam Moskowitz uh, crowd is actually much better at being fans. You know, they're they're better at running conventions. They're better at kind of doing fan clubs and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And the Futurians, you know, they are, really aren't that good at that kind of stuff. They're, they're almost like this like kind of weird counterculture to the mainstream that Campbell represents. But you know, they're they're kind of lousy fans, but they produce great writers. They produce great editors. You know, so yeah. I think that dynamic is really interesting where they actually were kind of bad at being fans, but they kind of regrouped and they kind of withdrew into themselves. And, you know, they ended up being much more important in how science fiction evolved than the fans who were running conventions. Yeah, it's just it's so funny because it's when I was reading all that stuff, it was so like accurate for right now. Like, yes, it, it, I, I couldn't believe how. um closely it resembled it it was just that that was great as far as um the one thing that i didn't know um about the whole dianetics and scientology thing when i was looking into this was the how there were different people kind of wanting to do different branches of it did those branches ever catch on or did um like L. Ron Hubbard Scientology kind of squash all that. Well, I mean, it, it all really did, obviously. Um, but early on, yeah. So this is actually interesting, and it's something that I didn't really have room to develop at length in the book. But um, yeah, you, you do see these like different dynamics movements that kind of emerge after the initial foundation splinters. You've got Campbell kind of working on his own, you know, working on this kind of Campbellian dynamics therapy uh, with his wife Peg. You've got Hubbard, who, you know, eventually takes Dianetics and makes it into something like like Scientology. But you also have these, uh, you know, kind of offshoots. Uh, you know, there's one in Florida, there's um, one in California, you know, that are exploring this stuff in their own way. Um, and that, that was kind of the, the original impulse, at least for Campbell, you know, behind Dianetics. It was supposed to be this movement that you could just kind of appropriate and uh, use 
yourself. And, and it, it, you know, he encouraged experimentation. He encouraged people just to kind of like start their own groups. And, you know, there were a bunch of independent clubs established throughout the country. And, and you know, the big kind of uh, development with Scientology is that Hubbard says, no, this is my property. You know, I'm the one who is going to kind of tell you what this therapy is. Um, and I think that's the reason why, you know, it kind of died out. You know, that's, that's the reason why you, you don't really see um, these like offshoots anymore. Um, but there is, a, there was like, like a very interesting period in the fifties when, um, yeah, I mean, Dynetics was being practiced by people who were not Hubbard affiliates, you know, who, you know, were just kind of doing it on their own. And, and after Scientology, uh, emerges, that kind of goes away. How did Campbell view British authors like, um, Arthur C. Clarke? That's a great question. Um, Clark is someone I wish I could have put more of in this book, uh, but he just wasn't um, as much a part of Campbell's life. And I think that actually is the, the, the key takeaway here. So uh, Clark sent, published his first stories in Astounding. Uh, you know, he clearly was suited for Campbell's approach, and, and the two of them were, you know, uh, at least in the early days, uh, you know, very well suited for each other. Um, but I think he was too far away uh, to be influenced by Campbell directly. And I think he appears at a point in uh, Campbell's career where Campbell is actually looking for writers that he can mold yeah. and who can kind of serve as vehicles for his ideas. Um, and I think, it, honestly, the difference was geography. I, I think people like Campbell or, or people like uh, Clark were just too far away from Campbell to, to have that kind of uh, relationship um, that he had with Asimov, for example. Um, and even Heinlein, who was, you know, living uh, in Los Angeles, uh, you know, they, they still corresponded uh, and, and they were able to kind of have that, uh, you know, dynamic um, remotely. Um, but I think by you know, the time Clark shows up, he's just, you know, too far away for Campbell to have that kind of impact on him. Now, were there a lot of other, and I know this might be outside, um, but the way... Campbell was going about stuff like he would just like throw an idea at somebody and if they did kind of what he approved of, then that was someone he would give more stuff to like that. Was that a common practice among editors or at least street and Smith or. Um, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think Campbell, or at least the way Campbell approached it, uh, you know, was pretty unique. I, I think, you know, I'm sure there are other editors who kind of gave out ideas to writers, you know, that, that, that seems natural, especially in the thirties when there's this like very close, uh, network of mm -hmm. writers and editors that you don't really see anymore. Um, but you know, I mean, Campbell, I mean, for one thing, he, he, he did say that he, when he gave an idea to a writer, he didn't want to get it back in quite the same way he pitched exactly. it. You know, he wanted, he wanted writers to kind of do it their own way. Um, so, but, you know, but again, he, he didn't want them to stray too far either. So there's this like very interesting line he walks where he wants writers who can kind of contribute something new and interesting to the idea he gives them. But he also wants people who will just kind of produce stuff on demand, uh, you know, following like these, these premises. So, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, frankly, I think what he did is pretty unique. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't think there's any other precedent for it uh, at the time, uh, even within science fiction. And I don't think it's it's even possible now. I, I don't think it's possible for any editor to have that kind of influence over a writer's career. Um, and what was Campbell's relationship with Paul Anderson? That's a good question. Uh, I mean, Anderson is obviously like a fascinating figure who I wish I could have talked more about, but he kind of shows up on the scene a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. um, they were very close, and Anderson talked, uh, you know, he, he kind of like Asimov did, spoke of Campbell as being his intellectual mentor, um, you know, having had this huge influence on his life. Um, and I think, I think that affection... Uh, persisted. I, I don't think they ever fell out in quite the same way that, um, you know, Asimov and, and Heinlein, uh, did in some ways. Um, you know, but yeah, Anderson certainly had his differences with Campbell. Uh, you know, probably my favorite story about that partnership is, um, Anderson wrote this, uh, uh, serial called the long way home, uh, in the fifties. And, um, there's a character who's a slave who says, who, who's given the, the chance to be, um, to have, to have her freedom. And she actually says no, because she thinks she's better off the way she is now. And for Anderson, this is like a very minor plot point. You know, it's just a characterizing touch. But Campbell just loves the idea that some people might be better off as slaves. And so it just kind of takes him in this whole direction for a couple of years where, you know, he talks about this in editorials and, in, you yeah. know, in, in conversation and letters. And I think Anderson was just a little bit, uh, 
a little bit uh, nonplussed by the by the use that Campbell, uh, you know, took from that idea, and I think um, you know it made him uncomfortable. So I think that's that's pretty typical of uh, how they interacted. Wow. Um, was there anything? I'm sure there was tons of stuff, but was there anything that you really wanted in the book that you had to cut out just for time? Oh yeah, I mean, so the 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 original draft of this book was twice the length uh, of the version oh, that was published, and you know, it wasn't padded. You know, this is all stuff that I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I didn't talk much about Horace Gold at Galaxy, uh, who I think is fascinating, and he and Campbell had this like really interesting rivalry uh, that I, you know, it, it, it was like a couple of pages in the, in the first draft and now it's like a footnote, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that would have been great to explore. Um, there's a ton of stuff from late in the, the story that I had to kind of compress because, you know, I mean, I think this book is like rightly, rightfully focused on the golden age and kind of like the aftermath. Yeah. But, you know, that means that there's like 20 plus years of Campbell's career that um, I, I, I barely have a chance to, to talk about. And, you know, yeah, there, there's a ton of stuff about his late obsessions, about astrology, about dowsing. I wish I could have talked about – I don't really talk about his work on the radio, which, you know, um, I would love to talk more about. Um, and that that's like – that goes doubly for Hubbard, Asimov, and Heinlein because yeah. we're talking about – you know, like the last third of their lives, I had it covered about 10 pages. So obviously there's a lot of stuff that had to get cut. Yeah, sequel. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, and, you know, one thing I should mention, and this is like not really a plug, but you know, I, I do have a blog. Uh, if you look for my name online, you'll find my blog, and I, I do publish a lot of this stuff uh, in that form. You know, a, a lot of the blog posts I write about uh, science fiction are, are just kind of material that I repurposed from the original draft of the book. Oh, so, nice. and, and it gives me a chance to kind of go get into the stuff, you know, in, in greater detail and at, at greater length than I ever could in the book itself. Oh, perfect. I'll put a link in the notes for that. Okay. Um, but yeah, man, I really appreciate you taking the time. The book is amazing and I love it. Well, it's not amazing. It's astounding. That's the joke. Yeah. 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 No, um, I, thank you. <laughs> I, I just absolutely loved it. So, um, yeah, this has been amazing to talk to you. I'm really excited. Yeah, no, and thank you. I mean, I, I loved your initial reaction to the book. And um, no, I mean, the, the, the responses I've gotten from readers have been just fantastic. You know, like the, the kind of feedback I've gotten and, you know, people are just kind of waiting for this book, you know, and I yeah. think um, I think I reached a lot of people who have been um, wanting to read this story for a long time. Perfect, man. Well, thank you so much and have a good rest of the day. OK, thanks. Thank you. Man. you too. So I hope you enjoyed that. <clears throat> that was amazing. And I keep saying amazing. Um, I don't know what the heck's wrong with me. Um, but the book is called Astounding. John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, Robert A. Heinlein, L. Ron Hubbard, and the Golden Age of Science Fiction by Alec Nabala Lee. And again, I want to thank Alec for coming on the show and spending time with us. Um, there were, as, as soon as... I was done. I came up with like 80 more questions to talk to him about. Um, but this is just one of those subjects that you can just talk about forever. So, um, let me know what you think. Um, send me some questions or some things you want to talk about, about that. Um, you could either leave it in the comments, um, on the blog, or you can, um, just email them to weirdmasszine at gmail.com. And, um, yeah, and that's it. And we will get another episode up here soon. Um, probably not before the holidays. So, um, for those of you in America, have a great Thanksgiving. For those of you who aren't in America, enjoy your month.